Hello and welcome back to part two of creating sports graphics with Boris Continuum. My name is Ben Brownlee from Boris Effects and we are going to be continuing off where we left off in part one. So if you haven't checked out part one first, then I would heartily recommend you do that before watching this now. So in this part, we're gonna be diving straight back into Title Studio and taking our flat 2D art and turning them into 3D models. We're also gonna be looking at how uh, Title Studio works with those 3D models, the different ways it can render those out. And we're gonna to have to tweak up our 2D animation in this new 3D world. So let's get started. All right, so here's where we left off from the previous exercise. And now let's pop back into Title Studio and give this a little bit of depth, shall we? It's looking a little bit, uh, a little bit flat, a little bit boring. Okay, let's come in here. And the first thing I'm going to do is when I'm finished with the animation, as we were in the previous exercise, I'm actually going to turn off the auto animate key. So we're just back in static mode. So I don't want uh, everything to be animating in and out because as we're gonna tell soon, pretty much everything can be animated in. Right, perfect. So let's turn off the other rings that we're not interested in and we'll just take a look at actually ring two, which is this inner ring. And before I go too far, let's give these proper names because ring one, ring two, ring three, ring five aren't that particularly inspiring names. I will call this inner ring. This one here is middle ring. And this one here is outer ring. Or outer tring, whichever you prefer. Okay, so with our inner ring selected, we're gonna change up how we look at this. So in our timeline, we can tell that we've got a name. We can tell the uh, media we have is an EPS file. It is unlocked, it is visible. And this is our track shape. So currently, we have our track set to a one-sided plane. And this means that when we see it rotate around, as we do around here, we can see that it's just a planar shape. So that means it's infinitely thin. And when we see it on its side, it will completely disappear. We don't want that. We're going to turn this into an extrusion instead. So if I turn extrusion on, all of a sudden, up in our controls, up at the top, we have more options available to us. Just going to undo that with uh, control or command Z. And you can see we've got four options. And then I'll redo that. And now we have five. We've got a new tab that says extrusion. So we can make this a really big extrusion. We can make this a really thin extrusion. We'll keep this at the starting value just for now, though. We can also give our shape a bevel. And if I turn our bevel up here, you can see we've got beveling. So it doesn't just come up straight as a straight extrusion. We actually have a nice bevel on this here as well. And we can change our bevel depth. That means the bit that sticks out past the extrusion. And we can change our bevel type as well. Uh, so we can change this from being straight bevel to being a convex bevel. So we get a smooth roll off here. So it looks like a, uh, a polo suite. Or we can have a concave, concave look there. Or we can even choose a custom one. And if we choose custom bevel, it actually lets us come in on the custom bevel and choose a different type of uh, spline. So we can start to draw a spline in here. And that spline, there we go, look at that, gorgeous. Uh, that spline will control the bevel we have. If I zoom in a little bit to 100, let's shift this over just by holding down the space bar you can actually see i could be controlling the spline or yeah controlling the bevel with the spline there we can get some really nice custom looks going on on our bevel really nice edging there mm, shall i keep that yeah actually i i think i think i might this wasn't part of my plan but i kind of uh Oops, I kind of like how that's looking, so I'm going to just roll with it. There we go. Okay, so let's come back up to our inner ring again. Let's close this up so we don't get confused about what's happening. Uh, come back up to the extrusion, and I can say back bevels as well. So if I say back bevels, 
it means as I rotate this around, let's just uh, spin this around here, it means we'll have the bevels on the back as well. Without that, we just get a flat area. Kind of makes sense. Let's just undo that a few times so I haven't spun that around again. Uh, but I will turn on back bevels, that's good. And the extrusion contour, I can have that set to straight or I can set a custom one on that as well. So we've got, you know, really fine controls that we can be doing on our extrusion. But I kind of, uh, I like how that's looking right now. That's, that's kind of got a bit of a uh, class to it. Really nice and simple as well. And let's do that with the other ones. I'm just going to come in, I'm going to go to my middle ring now. I'm going to turn this into an extrusion. Keep that at uh, 1.5. Take my bevel type to concave. Give it a bevel amount and a bevel depth. Back bevels as well, please. Let's bring that out there. So we've got just a slightly more complex shape happening. I like the way that's looking. Yeah, that's cool. And let's come to our third one, turn the visibility off in the middle ring, turn the visibility on on the outer ring, turn this into an extrusion, do exactly the same thing. Uh, concave again, I think. Extrusion type, will leave that where it was. Give this quite a big bevel, quite a big amount of depth. There we go, back bevels as well. Okay, cool. Well, let's have a look now at all of those three together. Turn the visibility on for all of those. And yeah, it's looking like a bit of a mess. Well, one of the reasons is if we take a look at the shape position on our middle ring, let's have a look at the animation, what that's, what that's doing. We've got the spin happening from minus 157 there. And what I need this to do is we haven't got the spin coming in properly here. So the spin at this point should be around about zero-ish. So let's make, make it a little bit that way. So about plus five. And so that should be at the end when we come here minus, yeah, minus 28, that's, that's cool. Let's come into the middle here. Now we've got these big fat extrusions happening. A couple of things are, are going on uh, in our shot. One of the things is now we've given these all depth. They're actually too close together. Uh, there's a couple of things that we can do to kind of contract them in a little bit. Uh, one of the things is if I go to the inner ring here and come into my extrusion, one of the things is I can just come into edge contract. And just what that will do is just, yeah, contract the edge just in a little bit. So it's a nice way of just compensating for any sort of models that just swell a little bit as we add in the extrusion. Uh, the other thing we could do possibly is just come in and, uh, you know, change the master scale up a little bit on the middle ring. Uh, take that to what, 203 which means also that I need to come in and change the master scale on this one, on the uh, outer ring, and maybe even just contract the edge a little bit there to get that working in properly. Uh, another thing you're going to see, look at this here, is that this doesn't, oh, and oh, sorry about that, let's just zoom back to fit. One of the things you're going to see now is where these three rings are rotating around and intersecting with each other, they're not intersecting quite right. And the reason for that is a simple one. Take a look at our scene here. It says scene 2D composite. And what that means is the way that Title Studio is set up to render this scene is just as a 2D composite. So the layers that are on top are the ones that are going to be rendered on top of the other layers underneath it. So if I change the layer order, so the outer ring and the middle ring were behind there, we've now got, you know, the outer ring at the very bottom, middle ring still in the middle, and the inner ring is uh, on top. 
So this, you know, maybe fixes some of the problems, but still, as these pass around each other, they should be interacting with each other in a completely different way. So let's come up to our, our scene, our main scene here. Come over to render. And I can change my render type from a 2D composite, where we're just rendering out the layers in the layer order, to a 3D render, where it actually looks at the uh, position of all of these in Z space. So as we have the, the proper depth coming in, you can see it's going to start to interact with the layers in depth. And it doesn't matter what layer order I've got these in. If I change that back up to the top there, it doesn't matter. The fact is, if they intersect with each other in space, they're going to intersect with each other, there we go, in the actual animation. So I know now that I have to scale my middle, sorry, scale my outer ring up a bit, uh, a bit higher, and I'm going to come into my middle ring here, and I'm going to contract the edge on that as well. I'm going to contract the edge on my outer ring a bit more just so we get three separate rings rather than rings that are intersecting each other. There's something going on there as well. Ah, I see why, because they're passing through in that way. So I'm going to rejig the animation. So I think what I'll do is I'll have the, uh, the spinning stopping very quickly. You can see as I add in a new value here, there we go. It's automatically going to add in another auto uh, keyframe, even though I don't have the animation turned on, simply because I've already got this value, this property animating in already. Same here. Let's take that to around about minus 20 something. There we go. So we still get the movement just coming in, but we don't get that. Uh, interaction. Now I don't have to give it quite as much edge contract as I was doing before. There we go. All right, let's play that back. That's looking better. So we've got a nice bit of separation between the layers. We've got the, uh, or sorry, the rings, and we've got the rings animating in in an interesting way now. So there's always a little bit of movement to it. And we can sort of tell that they're not crossing over each other. Cool. So the only thing I might do on this one is maybe on the middle ring, just give this a bit of a bigger bevel. I would give it a bigger bevel. And I contract it in just a little bit more. And maybe change the master scale up just a little bit as well. So we don't clash with the inner ring. Let's take a little look at that. Yeah, cool. And maybe now I can uh, spin that just a little bit more as well. See, so that's going behind. Yeah, cool. All right, okay, so that's that's beginning to look all right. Okay, good. So if I come up to the viewer up at the top here, we can change the view that we are working with. So at the moment, I'm looking at the render camera. So that's the camera that's built into the scene. I'm going to look at cameras later on in this series. But we can also look at these from the uh, orthogonal views. So we can look at the uh, how it's going to look at when we just look straight front, how it's going to look from the left hand side, right hand side, top and bottom, back. And we can also look at a world view as well. So there's sort of a perspective view, and we can see how things are going to be working just in that view there. And this could be really useful to picture how the shapes are working and interacting with each other without coming in and messing up with your animation at all. And we can split these up so we can have a look at dual horizontal, so we can look at what's happening in our camera on one side and what's happening in perspective on the other side here. What this leads me down as well is coming in and having a look at some of these shaders. We have a number of different deformers and image processors that we can use depending on the footage and type of scene that we're working on. If I stick on a glow edge here, and I'll just bring it over the top uh, down in the timeline, uh, it says disabled shader. 
And the reason it's disabled is because our render type is a 3D render. If I turn this to 2D composite, all of a sudden now, we can actually come in and start to add in our glow here. Uh, it's not disabled anymore. But of course, our scene stops being a 3D render. Let's turn that back in. If I come up to deformers, and I'm going to use something, uh, let's use the bend taper twist. I can actually start to bend things around in 3D space using my bend or taper or twist. That's going to be great to add a sort of particular, just a little bit of um, extra oomph to a particular shape. You know, maybe make things so they're not quite perfect. And the way this works is that if it's above multiple objects, it's going to affect all of those objects. If I were to just drag this into just my outer ring here, it's only going to affect the outer ring. But if I bring this up, it's going to affect all three of the rings. And I kind of like how it's, how it's working. I'm just going to turn this back to a single viewer over here and look back in the render cam. And I kind of like how that's twisting in. Maybe it's twisting in just a little bit too much or bending in just a little bit too much. But I like the fact that they're not 100% perfect rings. Let's bring this down there. There you go, 0.76. And, we, and let's play that back. And this is being accelerated by the GPU. So this is quite a cheap effect in terms of processing power. Cool, so we've started to build up that first stage of the animation. I'm starting to like where we're, uh, where we're headed with this now. And on that note, we're going to stop this part here and we're going to continue on into part three. In part three, we're going to be looking mainly at textures. How we can take this from being flat, boring, white rings into something that actually has a bit more character and a bit more, um, a bit more oomph, a bit more life. So in this section, we have looked at how we take our flat images and we start to extrude them out and create 3D models out of them. We then also looked at how we place these in a 3D scene and how we can start to add deformers onto our 3D models to give them a bit of extra life. And I think we're going to leave that there for part two and carry on in part three. Thank you very much for joining me with Creating Sports Graphics with Continuum and I'll see you in the next section. Thanks for watching and be sure to go to borisfx.com to download a free trial of Boris Continuum so you can try this out yourselves. If you want to see more of this type of tutorial, be sure to leave a comment below. Also, subscribe to the Boris YouTube channel to stay up to date with the latest information and training materials on all of the Boris FX products.